All right, if you have a Bible, open up to 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, I think anniversaries and holidays are a great time to sort of remind ourselves of certain key truths. I know that my natural inclination is that I get bored really easily. And I won't, how many of you will rewatch shows? You're show rewatchers, okay? You guys are weird. I don't, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I mean, it has to, unless it's The Office, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rewatch it. And I just, <laughs> I don't like reruns and, and I'm always trying to learn something new. It's just the way that I'm wired. But the Christian life, you've got to come back to certain fundamental key truths over and over and over again. And as a pastor, it's my job to help steer us that direction and, and remind us. And Molly was telling me that she was listening to this sermon the other day, and, and I said, what's it about? And she's like, well, it was about reading the Bible. And I was like, oh, that's deep. <laughs> and, and, you know, she said, the point was you need to read the Bible. And I said, you know, that sounds like a really good pastoral message. And, and, you know, it's not probably the most exciting message, but there's things that need to be, you know, it's healthy for your pastor to remind you of stuff. Paul said, for me to remind you of the same things over and over, it's not grievous, but for you it's safe. It creates safety and comfort and, and protection. So uh, I like to do things that are exciting. I like to, um, and this is an exciting message to me, but I'm just telling you, what I want to do for the next several weeks is try to refocus on some key truths about why we're here as a church and why we're doing what we're doing and um, so that we have a clear understanding of that and so we can all work towards the mission together because this is something we're trying to do collectively. It's not not just me trying to do something, thank God. And so we want to have clarity about what our vision is as a church. I think every church, there are a lot of amazing churches in Kansas City, and I think every church has a unique calling on the church. And it has to do with the, with the grace giftings that are in that church yeah. because there's different people in, di- in different churches. And I, I used to work for a really big church, and um, we had a whole bunch of different ministries that were there because we had all these different people and I don't, we haven't had this as much here because I think people understand we're still just pretty early on. But people would come to me, not infrequently when I worked for Pastor Lawson, and, and sort of ask, you know, why don't you have X type of ministry? And I'm like, well, we got all these ministries, but, but no, why don't you have this one? And, and the answer is because I don't have that leader. I mean, that was, was really the, I, I'm, I love all, the, I, as a pastor, I love to empower ministry, and I love to see stuff happen, but I can't do all the ministry, and, and Pastor Lawson can't, and we're called to do certain things, and so the reason certain churches have certain ministries is because that's the grace that's on the people that are there. Does that make sense? And I think there's a, such a thing as, as individual grace, which is, you know, your individual gifts and callings. But I also think there's a corporate grace that has to do with, with what the church as a whole is called to do. And 1 Peter 4.10 says this, it says, As every man has received the gift, that's talking about the grace of God, the, the gifts and talents that are in you and stuff, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So that says every man has received the gift. All right, so have you received some grace gifts from the Lord? Yes. yes. Everybody, yes, everybody, I have, okay. So the trouble is in church, a lot of times you see somebody, I mean, like you watch Skyler or somebody, and it's obvious what the grace is that's on his life, right? And it's really, it's, you're like, wow, that's amazing. And the, the trouble is you can tend to sometimes look at people that are gifted in certain areas and think, well, because I'm not like that, I don't, I don't have anything to offer. And that's not true. You have a, a grace that's on your life, uh, a gifting that's on your life, and you're meant to serve one another and help one another using that grace. Everybody see that? And the same thing is true collectively as churches. And we want to be good stewards of the grace that is on us. So 
When Molly and I came here three years ago now, actually it was three and a half, it was January of 2016. And uh, anyway, God spoke to us, and he said that there were three things that we were supposed to emphasize and do as a church. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to spend the next several weeks re-emphasizing those and explaining what they are and why we do the things that we do and, and why we think that helps people. And uh, so the, the three core values are wisdom, power, and love. And so I'm going to go through them uh, each individually. But first of all, we believe we exist to teach the wisdom for, of God for every area of life. We believe we're to demonstrate the power of God, and then we believe we're to receive and reflect the love of God as a community of faith. Now, that's sort of mission statement-y, but I, I really mean that. That's, that's what we try to do. So the first one is wisdom. And wisdom, in the Bible, it's, it's really talking about applied knowledge. It's the solutions of heaven to earth's problems. There's not a problem down here that there isn't an answer to up there. The problem usually isn't the problem. It's very often our perspective on the problem and how we think about it. And what wisdom does is it, it brings revelation. And what revelation is, is it, it literally means an unveiling. So there was something I couldn't see. It was hidden from my eyes, but then the Lord spoke to me, and the veil lifted, and I saw something that I previously couldn't see, and it changed how I lived. That's what revelation is. In my life, I've seen this a lot of different ways, but one example I use frequently is that I, for a long time, didn't see God clearly, and I'm still working on that. <laughs> but I, I thought that if I had any sort of problem or sin or anything like that, that he couldn't talk to me. And what that did was it really hindered my relationship with the Lord because I had this long-term unforgiveness in my heart uh, that I hadn't dealt with, and I thought that, that God wouldn't talk to me until I dealt with that. But then one day the veil came off my heart, and I saw the Lord for who He really was and that He always wanted to converse with me and have fellowship with me. I saw Him talking to Adam immediately after Adam sinned. I saw that the Lord runs towards sinners, not away from them. And that changed how I lived in the present. Amen. And the amazing thing about Revelation is, I mean, once you see it, that's when the breakthrough comes. John 8.32 says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we exist as a church, I believe one of the primary calls that's on our life is to help people have a revelation of who God is and who they are, and have understanding of their situation. Our goal is to, is to help you have those revelation moments. And so I, I'm not trying to, I'm really not trying to pat myself on the back here, but I want I want everybody to see and be encouraged, and I'd love all my, my uh, you know, workers and stuff are working, so maybe I'll show them the tape or something, but if, if you've been here for some amount of time, and you can honestly say you've received some kind of revelation being here, just raise your hand. Okay, so what, what that means is that we're doing what God told us to do. And so we're being successful. And, and, you know, I love doing lots of different things, but we're going we're gonna to continue to teach the Word. And that's, you know, and we're not going to back off that, and we're going to proclaim truth, and we're going to bring clarity to things. So let's read 2 Corinthians 3. This describes how revelation and wisdom work. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 14 through 18. And I will try to preach kind of quick because I'm sure some of you can smell the chili and people were telling me that that was distracting them. So anyway, 
2 Corinthians 3, verse 14, uh, says, this is talking about people in the Old Testament, it says, their minds were blinded. Do you know that your mind can be blinded? It really can. For until this day, there remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away with in Christ. Now what he's talking about specifically is that when the Jews read the Old Testament, they couldn't see Jesus in there. But, I've noticed that many Christians can read the Old Testament and know that there's stuff about Jesus and still have confusion enter their heart about who God is based on some of the stuff that's in there. And it says, and even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. What's the veil? It's, in this case, it's religious misunderstanding about the nature of God. Yep. Nevertheless, when it, when the heart shall turn to the Lord, what will happen? The veil shall be taken away. What's that mean? How many of you want to see God clearly? You have to repent, you have to, which means change your mind, and you have to turn towards who? The Lord, which is, which is Jesus. So what that means is, in, in my mind, I've got to turn from any picture of God that doesn't look like Jesus and shift myself to where God looks exactly like Jesus. Jesus is the perfect picture of the Father. And so we don't need, you know, I, I love all these deep theology stuff and I love answering hard questions, but look, if you, can't, if you can't see it in the life of Jesus, if you can't make the case from the life of Jesus, then you, ne- you need to let go of that picture of the Lord. Because He's the full and final representation of the Father. And He goes on to says, say that. It says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18, this is one of the best verses in the Bible. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The reason that we we stress this stuff and we deal with controversial issues and we try to bring clarity and try to answer hard questions is that I believe there's transformative power in seeing God for who He really is. And we don't, we, we, we're going to be clear and upfront about that. And we want to see people's lives changed by the goodness and love of God. Breakthrough is the result of seeing clearly. One of the main ways that the devil tries to attack us is in our minds. It's in our thinkings. He seeks to fill our thoughts with confusion and wrong ideas, wrong ideas about God, wrong ideas about ourselves or our situation. But the truth will set you free. And you know, Molly and I have both had this experience, and and you'd think we would... I mean, we're learning from it. (laughs) How many of you have to repeat a lesson every now and then? All right. The Israelites took a couple laps around that mountain, you know, so don't feel bad if it takes you a couple laps around the mountain. But, but sometimes, if, if you've ever had just, just a, a, a cloud of confusion or anxiety or worry or, or depression or something come on you, like if you, if you talk to a person or if you walk into a room and you feel something like this come on you, Often it's not you. Often it's you picking up on the situation, the spirit that's in the room or whatever. And sometimes if you, if you talk to a person that's really distressed, they'll, they'll slime you a little bit. And some of, the, some of the demonic juice or whatever there is, I don't think that's the technical term, but whatever, whatever... Whatever, there's, the spirit realm is real. Okay, and people's spirits affect your spirit. And, and, you know, so I don't know what that, somebody that's got, some people have discerning the spirits. I don't, 
I don't need to see all that. I, I'm, I'm all right. So, <laughs> so anyway, things happen in the spirit realm, and, and you can get slimed. But one thing that I've noticed is when I just recognize just the simple, just the simple thought, hey, that's not me, right. it'll lift. Yes, it will. Because the truth will set you free. Yes. Yes. It's that simple. So, look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2. Why are we here? What's the goal of church? Paul said this to Timothy. The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The goal of church is to make disciples who make disciples. So we do Sunday mornings. You know, we put in, we put in a lot of work. I mean, ask people that come help me. We, we do a lot of this, but we do it because we want you to encounter the Lord, and we want you to hear the Word, and we do small groups, and we do counseling, and we do a bunch of stuff. But, but the point is, we want you to, to know this stuff and learn it so you can teach other people, so you can affect your family, so you can be a disciple who, who makes disciples and that's that's what church is like so we're trying to receive wisdom from God we're trying to pass it on and we want you to pass it on too and we're trying to raise up leaders that can that can do that so on the back of your notes does this make sense I mean why why are we here we're here to understand the wisdom of the Lord that's that's one aspect there's other aspects but this is a big one and you know, one of the main graces that's on my life is teaching, and so that's why I talk so much. And, you know, if you're wired like me, you think talking more is always the answer. It's not, <laughs> not always the answer, but, but that's how I think. So, anyway, uh, I've got seven core truths here that, if you've been here any time, you've heard me talk about these if you're new and you have any question about any of these, just send me an email. I can send you probably a whole series about each of these things that we've done. But these are the things that have changed my life, our leadership team. These are the things that have really shaped our culture and I think what, what help us. So the first one is, God is not mad. He's not mad at you. He's not even in a bad mood. He doesn't even have a frowny face. I've done this exercise for years with people where I ask them to picture the Father. So let's just do it together. Everybody close your eyes. All right, now, picture the Father. Now, what I want to suggest to you is that in some respect, your picture is shaped by your theology. So if, if he's far off and he's faceless, you might be seeing a God that's shaped through your theology that pictures him as a distant being that's not really, it's impersonal and not really connected with you. If you're being honest and you look at him and you, you see a frowny face or an angry face, Again, I think that's shaped by your theology. And what I want you to do is, is right now, I'm telling you the truth. I'll, I'll give you the scripture in a minute. God's not mad at you. So picture the Father, but put a smile on His face. That's the right picture. All right, everybody can open their eyes. How many of you are able to see that a little bit? Okay, so that's the, that's the truth. So let's just read one scripture this was the first series I ever did when we came here, which is called God is Not Mad at You. And uh, Isaiah 54, 8 and 9 says this. This was talking about in the Old Testament that he, that he was mad because there was wrath in the Old Testament, but it's been done away with in Jesus. And so it says, In a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. 
But in the new covenant, it, he's talking about, with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be wroth with you, nor rebuke you. Is that in your Bible? Yep. I have made, I've made a covenant. I've sworn not to be mad at you anymore. So I don't care what you've done. I think the Lord's oath is stronger than that. So that shapes our theology. And then we believe that, that evil doesn't come from God. John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life, and that more abundantly. So I know that life is complex, and there's, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a series on this later about where evil is. I think it's going to be one of the better things I've done, and it's going to be complex. But, but this, this is simple, all right? If it's good, it comes from God. If it's bad, it comes from the enemy. If you keep that straight, you'll be happy. I have really simple theology. That's what my pastor always said. It's, it's, God is good, the devil is bad, I'm going to serve Jesus. Now, in line with that, God does not control everything. Genesis 1.26 says that He let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the air and the fowl of the sea and over the uh, you know, fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So He says, let them have dominion. When He said that, He really meant it, which means that people have make choices. And when people agree with light, light increases. And when people agree with darkness, darkness increases. And moreover, uh, Adam and Eve yielded themselves to the devil and, and people are still doing that. And I, I've come to realize even more lately the, the uh, effect that the demonic realm has had over people and, and nations. And so I'm going to teach about that. I think it'll be interesting. Um, but anyway, it's, God doesn't... We have, cho we have free will. And I'm going to defend that later because it's come under assault lately. But, but anyway, that's what we believe. And if you don't agree with us about any of this stuff, we love you. I'm not worried. I'm just telling you, these are the things that have changed our lives. And so then we also believe that once you accept Christ, all of your sins are forgiven forever, even ones you haven't committed yet. So let's look at Hebrews 10, verse 14. Is everybody all right? So I know I've taught all these things, but we need, to, we need to be reminded of them. Hebrews 10, verse 14 says, By one offering He has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who are them that are sanctified? Verse 10 tells you, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Those are two of the best verses in the Bible. Okay, so are you set apart? Are you set apart by the blood of Jesus? How many of you have accepted Jesus? Okay, so God sets you apart. He cleans you off. How long did He do that for? Forever. How? What's that mean in the Greek? It means forever. You can look it up. So, what's what's that mean? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to Jesus and and. You know, be honest when you screw something up, you should. You need to maintain a good relationship. But, but the whole point is doing some sort of religious ritual over and over and over to try to clean yourself every time you screw something up puts you in a tremendous bondage. And so, again, if you disagree with us about that, it's fine. We love you. It's, it's not a big deal. But that's been really freeing to me. So when I screw up now, I don't run to God trying to fix myself, I run to God full of the awareness that I'm already forgiven and I'm already loved and I'm going to, to, to Him to receive grace so that I don't screw up again in the future. So I've quit, I've quit the guilt-shame thing. I've quit this cycle of putting myself on the shelf when I blow it. Anybody ever done that? So this is, this is church 101 as people are taught, you know, 
well, you screwed up, so now God doesn't like you for a little bit, so go sit over there in the corner with the dunce cap on, and then after a while, he'll calm down, and then you can come back. It, if you do that, and you think you've got to go through this process and have a ritual and whatever, you're going to start from ground zero every time you do something wrong. And it's really hard to grow up that way. I'm just being real, real honest. So what you need to do is just run back to Jesus. And He forgives you. And, and you better hope He can forgive sins you haven't committed yet because He, he died 2,000 years ago. So there aren't any more payments being made. So the blood of Jesus extends all the way to eternity past and all the way into the eternity future. It's one payment. And by one offering, you're forgiven forever. So I have a whole series about that. I know that raises questions. And, you know, that, that part's come under fire from different charismatics, and we love those people. And I don't, I don't really understand. I, I think some people think it's a, a slippery slope towards universalism or something, but no, it's not. That's... We, don't, we, we reject universalism, uh, but we just believe you just put faith in Jesus and keep putting faith in Jesus. Okay? My faith's in Jesus, not in my ability to do some kind of ritual. Okay. That's my opinion. All right. Ephesians 5. What are some other things that have shaped our, our opinion? Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't be drunk with wine... Hopefully everybody just brought pop or water. But anyway, <laughs> God help us. All right. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, that actually says be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be always in the process of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So what we believe is that you're meant to have ongoing encounters with the Holy Spirit where He's filling you again and again and again, and that you can have as many encounters as you need to be conformed into the image of Christ. I might still need some more, personally. Everybody all right? So I've taught a whole series on that, too, because I know if you... If you I, I know some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. So... so I may have to just reteach that. So I, I will when we get there. So you can, you can have a lifestyle of encounter with, with the Lord. Now, the first time is always special. How many of you understand that? But, but there's meant to be more fillings. The people that got filled in Acts 2 also got filled in Acts 4. All right? And then 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 says that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, or profit everybody. So, this is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's talking about hearing God's voice, praying for the sick, all these sorts of things, miracles. So how many people are given uh, spiritual gifts? Given to everybody. John Wimber used to say, everybody gets to play. It's not for the super dupers. It's not just for the pastors. And, and so this shapes us. We want everybody to be able to hear God, to give a word of knowledge. We want everybody to feel confident praying for the sick and, and uh, doing all those kinds of things. Now, obviously, it comes easier for some people. Some of it comes easier. But just, just because somebody's good at something doesn't mean you can't do it, right. even if it's a little harder in certain circumstances. But everybody can, can you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right, and then lastly, 1 Peter 2, verse 17 says that we're to honor all men. Everybody say, honor, honor. all men. Honor. So this is a major thing that's shaped the way I think about church and the way I try to talk about things and stuff is that I want to see people for who they really are and I want to treat them according to that. So what honor does is it sees past people's flesh, it sees who they really are according to their innate value, and it treats them accordingly. That takes practice. 
2 Corinthians 5.16 says that we're to henceforth know no man, don't know anybody after the flesh. It means you're, it's illegal as a Christian to look at somebody's outward behavior and think that, that that's who they are. You want, to, you want to treat them according to who they are in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have boundaries and, and things like that because you need to do that and, and all that, but we, need to, we want to have our, our lips seasoned with salt and grace and, and uh, not have a critical spirit or attitude. And um, if, if there's one thing I would change about my background, it is that sometimes, uh, you know, when you have a teaching-heavy environment, people get a lot of knowledge. I may be understand that. And the scripture says, knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. And so, occasionally, when people get a lot of knowledge, and it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a byproduct, it's not the goal, but sometimes people get a lot of knowledge, and then they get filled with pride, and then they start to talk in a dishonoring way towards people that don't know some of the stuff that they know. And so, we, we don't want to do that. So, we want to teach you but we want, to, we want to remain humble in the way that we communicate with people. Does that make sense? All right. So, that's what we're trying to do. We're going to keep trying to do it. I think it's going to be good. God's going to be with us. Let's all stand up. Um, we haven't talked about this. Can you come play the piano? Uh, if my prayer team could come down here. Well, uh, if you need personal prayer in just a minute, you can come down and pray with our prayer team. I'm going to pray for everybody, and then uh, we'll go out there and, and fellowship and eat. Please stay, even if you didn't bring food. I'm sure there's plenty of food. And uh, we'll also talk to you about some volunteer opportunities and stuff. There won't be any pressure, but we'll let you know what's, what's going on. We're excited for what God's doing. We're excited that we've had this awesome three years, and the future looks bright. God's with us. We're moving forward. And it's going to be good. So I'm going to pray for everybody.